लुटते हैं फ्राइड चिकन लुटते हैं फ्राइड चिकन हल्ला मोगनिका चिल्गम नगे मासिस्सुमिदा उन्हें क्या दोष है Yeah, I'm not that big. Lot the ham, fry the chicken. Lot the ham, ding dong chicken. A subliminal message. A subliminal message is the power of mind control. Hey, have you heard about the crazy new way to send the message today? It flashed on a screen too quick to see. But still you get it subliminally. Ladies and gentlemen, the 59 Chevy. See it? Isn't it beautiful? You used a subliminal cut. Now, quite a few subliminal cuts from some photos I made. Okay, class. 
Ross, today we are going to talk about subliminal advertising. What's that? Scully, are you familiar with subliminal messages? You mean like sex and ice cubes and liquor ads? Why would anyone want this shit job? Because it affords them other interesting opportunities. Like splicing single frames of pornography in the family film? Ivan et Miage, they keep saying that. Let me play this backwards. Join the Navy. <gasps> They're recruiting people with subliminal messages. Oh, what do you expect? Those bastards turned a whole generation of Americans into smokers with their damn subliminal advertising. Subliminal. It's a subliminal message, it's Broadway to trigger. I've been seeing this code pop up all over the last few weeks. It's Alliance and it's high military. Subliminal advertising complete. Look at something, smell something, hear something, it's going into your brain at the speed of light almost. And all being retained. Now what comes out in terms of cognitive or conscious perception is very limited bits and pieces of this. One of the earliest acknowledgments of the unconscious process appears in some of Aristotle's writing, which goes back a good bit. Sigmund Freud was the first person to coherently probe the existence of the unconscious and postulate that people have a lot of emotions and drives that they're not aware of. Freud's theories were, at, at the time, very uh, controversial. As he was telling people, in a sense, things they didn't really want to know about. Freud used a number of techniques to determine what their unconscious conflicts were, and uh, one of those that he was very involved with was interpreting their dreams. He felt that when people were sleeping, the barrier between the unconscious and the conscious relaxed and uh, the people actually experienced in the dream state their true unconscious motivations. Freud wrote an interesting book on the uses of these things socially and he warned these are dangerous toys to play with because we don't understand them, we're not likely to understand them and they're capable of triggering off a uh, pathological response. You know it really started in America with Ed Bernays who imported and used some of uh, uh, Freud's uh, you know, psychoanalytic theories to give people in their consumer choices substitutes for sort of primal urges. In his book, Propaganda, he said it was the duty of marketing people to lead an otherwise uh, unleadable, irrational, uh, free people to making a consensus or a decision that was a responsible decision. And so we've had, we had a marketing philosophy that was inherently about 
manipulating and motivating a public. In times like these, most men become highly suggestible. They listen eagerly for any voice which sounds authoritative. They listen eagerly for anyone who can tell them what is wrong and what to do to right it. And the best way to sell is to find an access to the subconscious. So you're not just presenting a product or a picture or a celebrity in, in film. You're, you're making that accessible to the unconscious processes of millions of people. Most of America learned about the concept of subliminal advertising in 1957. Uh, there was a marketing researcher by the name of James Vickery, and he announced that he had done these, this very elaborate experiment, supposedly. He claimed that he had conducted a secret experiment in a New Jersey cinema in which he had flashed the words hungry, eat popcorn, and drink Coca-Cola over the movie Picnic starring Kim Novak. And they weren't even single frame ads, they were much faster than that because he was using something called a tachistoscope. The high speed tachistoscope. This is a projector that flashes uh, about one fiftieth of a second, though you can change that speed. And he reported that, uh, that the Coca-Cola consumption went way up, the popcorn consumption went way up. Enormously successful. Like if you're watching a film and all of a sudden something will quickly flash that you can't actually see and it puts it in your mind that you maybe want a Coke. In the 50s, you know, like when movies started or now, they used to put, you used to go to movies, used to put the little uh, popcorn thing, right, subliminally there. And... I've heard that they do that in like movies, like buy Coke, it's like flash on the screen when it's right before the movie starts. So I could see how you could. Do you think they're doing that in movie theaters? Do you think it's... Oh, I get really thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of companies were interested, a number of TV stations uh, agreed to run subliminal ads. Many competitors came into the field with other products and television and radio stations openly admitted that they were experimenting with it. Radio stations were going to run uh, whispered ads where they whisper things like buy Oklahoma oil or drink 7-Up very softly beneath the records that the disc jockeys were playing. And it caused an outrage. Uh, the public got very nervous and very excited about it. Uh, there were all sorts of editorials against this. Congress decided that they would have to hold hearings on this. Vickery went to Washington to demonstrate this process. And, and this led to statements like uh, those by Norman Cousins that condemned subliminal as the most dangerous technology to have ever been developed by man. Works rather quickly decided that it was in their interest to prevent Congress from acting, so they formed this National Association of Broadcasters, and they all agreed that they would not allow subliminal advertising. And they took the, the position that it didn't work. They tried to calm the public's anxieties by insisting that it wasn't effective. Vickery dropped out of the, the consulting business and kind of retired, and as he later admitted, this was all basically a scam. The experiment that he said he'd done, he hadn't really done. They increased the consumption of Coca-Cola and popcorn enormously. And there's a little grain of truth to it. I mean, there have been other experiments. Arguably, there might be a moderate increase as a result of commands like drink Coca-Cola. It couldn't, it couldn't possibly amount to the statistics that he had uh, suggested. But once you let the, you know, the, the genie out of the bottle, it's very hard to put it back in. So we've had this, this almost a mythos of subliminal advertising ever since then.
The motivational researchers in the 50s developed a variety of electronic equipment that they could measure people's unconscious reactions to. Like uh, one of these was a galvanic skin response where they would measure minute fluctuations in the amount of sweat on your skin, which was related to your state of anxiety, or also a heartbeat or uh, they had special cameras in supermarkets that would measure the dilation of the pupils that would indicate how interested a person was in crime. The advent of new technology, positon emission tomography enhanced uh, magnetic resonance imaging, etc., and we're seeing a whole lot of new research come out, shows us what areas of the brain are excited by subliminal stimulation. Kilborn and Associates uh, in the mid-80s did a fascinating experiment when they took two actual advertisements that they believed contained subliminal impacts that they had found on their own. One of them was a Marlboro ad uh, which showed uh, you know, guys on a horseback driving through the range with big rocks around them. And one of the rocks, allegedly, had been made to look like an erect phallus. And uh, they hired an artist and they adulterated the picture and took the phallus out so they would have a control. They, and then they showed it to people and measured their galvanic skin responses and found out that the picture with the phallus had a greater effect than the picture without the phallus. We were the first uh, to demonstrate that you could detect responses from scalp electrodes where we had a group of words that were clearly negative and words that were clearly positive. And uh, the words are sort of mixed up together and they're presented at a thousandth of a second. So I wanted that to be no nonsense, you know, no question about whether people were aware. One thousandth of a second, you ain't seen nothing. And the basic finding was that the negative words, when they were presented subliminally, would have a bigger voltage of brain response than did the positive words. Uh, again, this goes back to the whole general scientific question, can a subliminal stimulus in and of itself cause a person's behavior to change? and to change in some significant way about something important. And the evidence there is problematic. There are some studies that say yes, others that say no. For one thing, they were the biggest group in the world. They had carte blanche at the EMI studios at Abbey Road, and therefore, they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. They were also unbelievably curious. In the summer of 1969, a bunch of college radio stations started this rumor that Paul McCartney had died, and that for some strange reason, the Beatles were keeping this secret. But it got a lot of people listening, listening very carefully to these later Beatles albums. And that's where John Lennon had done all this experimentation. They had an opportunity to do things with music that even their peers, frankly, couldn't do because they didn't have the time and the money and the cachet. And the Beatles also were experimenting with drugs. At the heart of this was, was really uh, a thing they found at the end of Strawberry Fields. Nothing to get hung about. 
I know, I buried Paul, that kind of thing, whatever. Yes, that's, that is manipulation. That is doctoring. But it's in the pursuit of art. It's in the pursuit of expression. Lennon later told Rolling Stone magazine that what he actually said there was cranberry sauce. So uh, I, in the recording studio, I had them play this with various filters to make the, the more legible. And it, it really does sound like cranberry sauce. There's a very big difference between, say, reverse messages and the artistic potential in manipulating sound. On the track Revolution 9, Number nine? Uh, the track's title Number is repeated nine? many times Number within nine? the song. Number and if you reverse nine. Revolution 9, it actually Number sounds nine? like Turn Me On, Number Dead nine? Man. Turn me on, Dead Man. Turn me on, Dead Man. Turn me on, Dead Man. Turn me on, Man. In order to write a lyric that will say one thing forwards and something else backwards, what kind of writer do you have to be? That's a genius beyond my comprehension. I can't imagine that anyone's that smart. You have to draw a distinction between what I call the engineered reversed messages and the ones that are purely coincidental. Uh, for instance, it's been found that if you say the words, Jesus loves you, record that and play it backwards, it sounds like we smell sausages. What it proves is that our minds have this great pattern finding ability and we can really make sense even where there's nonsense there. Uh, I would think that the Revolution 9 thing is purely coincidental. What we try to do with our music is to paint a picture, an audio picture, uh, to best uh, get across the message we're trying to convey with the lyrics. And uh, we use whatever means we can to do that. The first album I remember hearing anything like that on was uh, the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper. Uh, that was filled with all kinds of interesting uh, sound collages and spoken word pieces and specialty sounds. You know, some people talk about all oh, the dangers of subliminal messages. Uh, they talk about that in music and I think that topic itself is subjective. What is subliminal? It all depends on who's listening. You know, I hear things very clearly in records, you know, that are there because that's my gig. That's what I do. You know, I listen to things very carefully. Other people might think something subliminal because they've never heard it before. Well, they're just not focused on it. So I think it's all kind of debatable. We'd like to forewarn you to brace yourself because what you are about to see is hardcore truth that much of the mainstream media would like to keep hidden from your eyes. blown away if they realized the subversion that takes place in, in popular media and that the agendas that lie in back of much of that subversion. Here we see Robert Plant while singing Stairway to Heaven telling his fans that sometimes words have two meanings as he signs with his hands that they are both forward and backwards. Cause you know Sometimes words have to mean. But basically, backwards, and, and over 25 words, backwards, straight, it says, here's my sweet Satan. I want to live it backwards like the Zep, whose power is Satan, and he will give you, give you 666.
I was sitting in a room when I was producing Cinderella in about 1987. This child who was on methadrine started questioning me on this back of masking. It's crap. This satanic phenomena goes far beyond the scope of human ingenuity and is demonically inspired. Bob Garcia of AM Records stated, quote, it must be the devil because nobody here knows how to do it. Well, there's no point to that anyway. And you can make anything up you want if you wish. So I believe personally deep down they know what's going on and they were seducing their fans into hey, you know, the whole power trip. Backwards masking is rubbish. It never happened. We never did it. And that's just a fact I was there. There's so much evidence out there, but it's under the surface at first. And, and I think when people begin to see it, uh, hopefully they care enough about truth more so than experience. If you listen, they're there. Yeah, I heard them all. That's crazy. But it was definitely put there on purpose and um, maybe just for certain people to hear it. I could definitely hear the words in there. How did someone even find that out? Also a conspiracy theory, in my opinion, that's like, oh, there's hidden messages in this. The only thing I really heard was music. It kind of sounded like it was um, in a different language. Uh, I don't, it was kind of scary. <laughs> I mean, it sounded like it was saying something, but in a different language. You know, if you want to hear Satan talking to you while Stairway to Heaven plays backwards, then that's exactly what you'll hear. You'll find a way to hear it. First time in Devo that anybody ever said anything to us about subliminal messages, we'd made this short film, and it was long before MTV. It was called In the Beginning Was the End, The Truth About De-Evolution. And, um, Somebody came up to us after we showed the film once, this woman, and she was really mad. She goes, I know what you, you're doing. I know what you're up to. And we're like, what? What'd you say? And she goes, I know what you're doing. I saw it. I saw on the screen, I saw the word submit and the word obey. And we're like, wow, where'd those go? Where, how'd those get in there? And so we were, all, we were like, yeah, right. And after that, you know, we were thinking, oh, we got to put subliminal messages in our stuff now. To me, backward masking, you know, and the Beatles and Paula's Dead or any of that kind of stuff. To me, that was just all the fun stuff, that if you were a fan, you looked for that kind of stuff and you wanted to find it. The idea of it being dark or malevolent, you know, I think is just kind of paranoid thought on, on the part of people that already don't like the music. I, I don't, I, I never really saw anything of, of harm coming from, from backward masking. Emergency service. He's not a 
In what observers call a first-of-its-kind trial, attorneys today told a Nevada court that two troubled young men who shot themselves in 1985 were influenced by subliminal messages in a rock and roll album. The members of the British rock group Judas Priest listened in a Nevada courtroom today as one of their recordings was described as a killer. They heard you have to die to be a hero. And they had played over and over and over again this stained glass album, particularly a song, Better By You, Better Than Me. Now, what had happened is the two at a point had looked at one another and they had chanted, do it, repeatedly, do it, do it, do it. Had taken their father's shotgun, had left, gone to the schoolyard, propped shotgun underneath uh, Belknap's chin, pulled the trigger, killed himself. Vance hesitated, he didn't brace it, it blew the front of his face off. I would like to call certain people murderers. I feel that they murdered Ray. Are there subliminal duets on the Better By You, Better Than Me song? Absolutely not. I heard the word, do it, the words do it, but I didn't understand in what context or why it was there. I identified approximately seven of them. It's very difficult because it is uh, at a subliminal level. The group, Judas Priest, admitted that they had used subliminal messages on other recordings, just not this one. It is the claim of subliminal messages that propelled this case to trial. Similar lawsuits claiming rock music caused damage have been thrown out of court because lyrics are protected as free expression under the First Amendment. But the judge in this case says subliminal messages are not protected as free speech. What is really on trial here is the whole concept of subliminal persuasion. The courtroom is no place for reveries about the unknown capacities of the human mind. We took the judge into the control room and played all of the 24 tracks that were mixed to make this record uh, and showed the judge how, you know, you put, uh, it was actually at the end of uh, a vocal, and so there was an exhalation of breath combined with a guitar sound to, and then if you, if you, if you listen to that, with the thought in mind, the suggestive thought in mind that it says do it, you can hear do it. So yes, it, it, it was there. And that's what made me so uh, puzzled when the judge concluded that it, if it was there, it was there accidentally. That made no sense to me at all. CBS never produced the original uh, master. The original 24-track master would have been required in order for us to determine whether it had been intentionally placed there or it was indeed a coincidence of sound. And so I argued that it was the straw that broke the camel's back. And the judge decided, look, they had all kinds of reasons to harm themselves and to make a case for that alone, well, it didn't hold water. Prosecution have alleged us and tried to paint this picture of drug crazed Satan worshippers and nothing could be further than the truth. It's absolutely ridiculous and bizarre. And people just don't appreciate that, you know, we're humans with feelings like everybody else and we don't all sing about love. We would get power from, from the, uh, our emotions would just soar with the music and then they'd go up and down and up and down and it was like a drug, like a narcotic. Did you understand what he said? He said, looking back now, the mu music would almost drive you crazy. Drive you crazy? Well, yeah, it did. I wanted to climb the walls. I couldn't stand it. And uh, his behavior would just change. And you can't always blame it on the parents. You can't always blame it on the music industry. You can't always blame it on movies and television. But all these things we have to acknowledge have inf are influential factors on children and their decisions. So all of these things should be looked at and considered.
Hitchcock was really intrigued by this whole idea of subliminal effects in movies. Uh, in fact, the first time he used it was in uh, a film called Spellbound, which was a black and white movie, but it had one frame that was in color. And it occurs when a character is actually turning a gun on himself to commit suicide. Uh, and then when he pulls the trigger, there's a single frame of red. Uh, what he had to do was to pay an artist to basically hand tint that one frame in every print of Spellbound. Uh, so he obviously took this pretty seriously. Oh, I saw him in the editing room where he would cut right down to the frame, certain just frame by frame where he'd want his cuts. So he was, he took a great deal of time with the editor in what he wanted. When he came to do Psycho, he did something even more elaborate. Towards the end of the film, there's a very slow dissolve to a shot of the police pulling Janet Lee's car out of the swamp. Well, during that dissolve, Hitchcock superimposes this kind of skull-like face on Tony Perkins' face. So it creates a rather ghoulish effect. And obviously, Hitchcock thought that this increased the emotional punch of this particular part of the movie. Audiences are very gullible. I, I just feel that you can lead an audience like Hitchcock would do, and I think you could do it with subliminal. Uh, it would be very effective. If murder and knife and that sort of thing was intentionally put in, it was done, I wasn't around, it was done when he worked with the, uh, the writer. Walter Merchant and Richard Beggs with some of the electronics in Apocalypse Now, they were always mixing real sounds underneath sounds that weren't associated with the object to make you feel a certain way. Or anything that would heighten a certain fear um, during the warfare. On top of that desire to be very, very accurate was this desire to go very deep psychologically. I mean, there were any number of tricks or things that happened in that the soundtrack of that movie. During the helicopter attack on the village, a wooden trestle bridge is destroyed, and so these wooden timbers are their explosions. Also mixed in with that were the sound of bowling pins being struck with a bowling ball. Things like that were used extensively, and in a lot of other movies as well. Like I know, like in The Godfathers, you want to make fear something's going to happen, they mixed a baby cry, you know, and stuff like that. The baby crying is very, very important to pay attention to because otherwise there's no future. That's why babies' cries are so irritating. You can't you ignore it. Satan? I do renounce him. To me, that's creative, um, and that's tapping into this part of the brain. If you want something out in front of people, you don't hit them over the head with it, but you have it there so the audience maybe doesn't realize that, but it's imprinted in their mind that it's, when did I see that? Friedkin was an other director who was rather intrigued by this idea. And in his film, The Exorcist, he actually uh, uses subliminal shots in at least two very key parts of the film. Uh, one of them's in a dream sequence. And the other is during the actual exorcism. Uh, what you see are very brief two-frame shots of this kind of cadaverous face. And so, like, my brothers and I would always freeze frame on that one frame, and it's terrifying. You don't even want to look at it. So it does something to you, you know? So 
The question is, why are you doing that? In my mind, Exorcist was a groundbreaking film. It had never been done before. So he was really experimenting with the concept of being totally afraid and fear. Last June, delegates to the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting voted to boycott Walt Disney. They are pushing a Christian bashing, family bashing, pro-homosexual agenda. There was the suggestion that uh, a clergyman became sexually aroused while he was performing a marriage ceremony. The allegedly offending bulge goes by in less than a second. But if you were to slow down a few frames of this scene, you might think the preacher was indeed more than happy to see Ariel. There. Right there, right there, right there. What is it? Uh, it is clearly his knee. Everybody knows it's his knee. We ask for a transformation of Disney, or Disney will go down. It's just people spending too much time looking for things that aren't there. That's how we can sell sex to little girls! <laughs> See, if we make the posters with little girls reaching for your junk, then you have to wear purity rings or else Disney Company looks bad! <laughs> We thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of Domino's, KFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. You can see that the movie star is holding the Pepsi right there, but you're not thinking of it as a commercial, you're thinking of it as a movie. Converse All-Stars, Vintage 2004. <laughs> Don't turn your face up like that, I know you want some, all you gotta do is ask. Even product placement is normally a subliminal thing because you really don't think, hey, that guy's drinking a Coke, but you do see it and it does register in your brain. I think that's the best way to do it than hitting them over the head with a product right in their face. So in some sense, I think you could say even product placements are probably the most successful form of subliminal advertising. I want the perfect food. Imagine all those burgers in your stomach, right? The average TV viewer 
sees about 30,000 commercials per year. That's 30,000 repetitions of a single message. And the single message is, buy this, do this, it's going to make you feel better, you're going to like it. If you're not doing it, you're probably not very hip. This is going to solve a problem for you 30,000 times. Systemically, um, advertising works better on people who are lonely and afraid. It's a kind of a form of reverse therapy. You know, you go to a therapist because he wants to resolve your unconscious conflicts and make you feel better about yourself. But media has exactly the opposite orientation. You need to create tension in the viewer, conscious tension and anxiety, so that they look to a product for relief. If people are happy, they're not going to buy stuff they don't need. There's been memos that have been circulated, you know, where insider advertising executives have said, it's our job to make women feel bad about themselves. We really believe that this is the way a woman should look. This, this version of some guy's marketing plan that he's set up. They all look at that pretty ad, you know, I like the boobs I'm looking at when I'm up. Uh, they don't realize that they're being engineered. We can look at things like anorexia and bulimia and say, as far as I'm concerned, you can look at that and say this is a media-driven event. Our families are being destroyed. I mean, we've never in the history of humanity been under an assault because we've never had mass media like we do today. Is the purpose of the television ad to make you an informed consumer making a rational choice? No. The purpose of the ad is to delude and deceive you with imagery. So you'll be uninformed, you'll make an irrational choice. Uh, that's what business spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year on. And the last thing they want is markets. Uh, what they want is coercion and control. You know, when Goebbels uh, developed uh, powerful propaganda system in Nazi Germany, they were explicitly borrowing, very explicit, from uh, uh, U.S. commercial propaganda, uh, commercial advertising, to copy these techniques. You know, simple slogans repeated over and over again, appealing to the emotions, I mean, all those ideas which had been worked into uh, practically a science. If we don't have any kind of critical analysis, some kind of overreaching way in order to analyze and understand what's being fed to us, how uh, people can be manipulated, people enjoy the manipulation. Advertising is fun. Reality is boring. You take the blue pill. The story, the story ends. ends. You wake, you wake up, up in your bed and believe whatever, whatever you want. want. You take, you take the, the red, red pill. pill. You, you stay, stay in wonderland. wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth. Let's see, um, TV pretty much. Advertisers are looking to get the attention of younger and younger children. And any advertising directed to a young child should be considered subliminal. Because young children don't know the difference between the ad and the program. It all blends seamlessly together. 
any advertising to four-year-olds or five-year-olds or six-year-olds is dealing with a consciousness which is not using rational processes. People use the television as a babysitter, right? They plop their kid down in front of a TV and uh, there's no guidance, there's no instruction, there's no parent sitting there watching TV with the kid. They start targeting children at nine months old. They've, they've noted that by two years old, they can achieve brand loyalty and recognition. This is extraordinary. When you see something on TV that you want, what do you do? Ask my mom for it. And what if she says no? Uh, I just keep asking and annoying her for it. <laughs> You know, every psychology student discusses, of course, the four fundamental drives, the four Fs. There is fight, flight, feeding. You never forget the four Fs when they're explained to you that way. Our society, largely driven in part by advertisers motivating us to consume, we end up with the fifth drive. It's more, more. systematically desensitize their threshold of arousal by increasing the amount of stimuli that we deliver that is sexual or violent or gross in nature. And so the more begins with I want more stimulation. And then it continues through everything else, whether it's more food, more alcohol and drugs, more cars, more money, more power, more women, more, 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 more. I mean, why, if, why are people maxed out on their credit cards and buying things that, you know, who knows if they need them? I mean, consumerism becomes a secular religion where we use uh, certain material goods to fill holes in our souls. Any one of us is, can be trapped by this. I mean, I would ask anyone to look around their house and how many things that any of us have bought over the course of the last 10 years we don't use. Simply knowing what's going on is not going to protect you from the effect. You can know perfectly well that they put this gorgeous model in an ad to get you all excited about Coors beer. The fact is, it's still going to work. We're all consuming and acting and behaving precisely the way that they want us to. It's what the church does, it's what monarchs did, it's what advertisers do, and you know, and, and the game continues. Some are wondering if perhaps there was a subliminal ad, a flash of a commercial product seen on the show. something, smell something, hear something that's going into your brain at the speed of light almost, and all being retained. He claimed that he had conducted a secret experiment in which he had flashed the words hungry, eat popcorn, and drink Coca-Cola. And it puts it in your mind that you maybe want a Coke. The public got very nervous and very excited about it. Strawberry fields forever. I buried Paul, that kind of whatever. Thing. whatever. Are there subliminal do-its on the song? Absolutely not. Why are people maxed out on their credit cards and buying things that who knows if they need them or not? Some are
wondering if perhaps there was a subliminal ad, a flash of a commercial product seen on the show. In the research that was conducted by the Roper organization, they found that 57% of Americans believe that subliminal advertising happens. I think there's so much in the air, there's so much a sense of sort of distrust in government, in you know powerful leadership, that I wouldn't be surprised to find that more people now believe that subliminal advertising is, is practiced than have in previous decades. I'm sure it does. Can't say I've ever picked up on it myself. There's got to be something, but I haven't like really noticed that. Not as much. I don't think. I don't think nowadays. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, well, you know, I think there's certain advertising companies, you know, that uh, uh, for whatever, trying to market an item, you know, just subliminally, they'll throw something in, and then uh, you don't even think about it. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. When I watch television for over a couple hours, suddenly I'm very hungry, and I do realize that is from the advertising or the subliminal messages. You mean like the uh, camel cigarettes? There you go. The, uh, the image on the camel? I mean, I'm sure that exists, absolutely. I'm sure it exists. I don't really know much about the technology, but I'm sure it does. I know it's supposed oh, yeah. to be illegal, but I know it exists, though. So. Yeah, you heard it was illegal? Yeah. Okay. My, my best example of subliminal messaging would be like when you watch a movie, and all of a sudden you see everybody's drinking Pepsi. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that the colors are subliminal. Like, no one really realizes that most things are a certain color for a reason. Well, I, I do believe that uh, advertising agencies use subliminals in their advertising. To be effective, a subliminal message has to either stimulate an unconscious anxiety or satisfy an unconscious fantasy. You discover very quickly that the human brain is extremely sensitized to things that deal with the beginning of life, reproduction, uh, sex, as we vulgarize it, and the end of life, death. Now, if you can plant something in there that's strongly motivating, sex and death, the unconscious will remember that for a long time. We don't know for how long. Most people can see what they want to see in almost anything. And there's an author who's a, a, I mean, it's a sad and paranoid guy who sees sexual imagery and ice cubes and everywhere he looks. Is there any way you could call that something else? I mean, it's not a telescope, it's not a leaning tower of pizza, it's a penis. The problem is we hide this stuff from ourselves. We don't want to deal with it. And once you come to terms with this, it turns the whole world upside down. If uh, uh, the medieval artists could do it, why not Chicken McNuggets? Uh, the SEXs are all over the crackers. Makes them taste better. I love Ritz crackers. The fact that he made some allegations that are not credible doesn't mean that the substance of what he had to say wasn't, you know, logical and totally persuasive.
This ad appeared on the back cover of Playboy of Time. The ad was used for about three years. How could this stuff ever sell Johnny Walker scotch? They didn't put any scotch in the glass. The glass is empty. Now, if you look at the ice cube that's on the table, the right side of that ice cube, you see an interesting looking face. Or a grotesque, almost surrealistic uh, mask. It's not an interesting figure to put in an ad. Uh, it's a monster with encircling arms and a skull-like face. It's a death symbol. There are a dozen of them in these six ice cubes. The predominant trend in modern subliminal advertising is, seems to be uh, sexual assault or sexual violence. And this is an example of that. If you look at her facial expression, it could be that she's finding it extremely unpleasant. And the, the person on the left seems to be violently ripping her necklace from her throat. Well, it, it reinforces the idea that women are victims and, and that it's sexy for a woman to be a victim. And that's very powerful and very important to maintain status quo in our culture. And that's how you can uh, convince men also that she deserves to be violated. She, uh, she wants to be hurt. She's, you know, look at her. This Benson and Henry's ad first appeared on the back cover of Time magazine and also in We magazine. On a conscious level, the ad is promising sexual excitement. But at an unconscious level, it's stimulating sexual anxiety. And the reason is that a lady's backbone has been carefully airbrushed to resemble an erect male phallus. Anxiety is associated with the consumption of cigarettes. We all know that people smoke more when they're nervous. It's totally logical to think that making them nervous induces them to smoke more. To really intend to make people anxious, uh, and you don't know how that person deals with anxiety, the only thing you're wanting is that he light up a cigarette. Uh, but you don't know what else it might do, okay? That, to me, is outrageous. If you're, you're very sensitive to the idea of phalluses, you're going to have a much harder time seeing the phallus in the Benson and Hedges ad than if you're not. And if you're more sensitive to it, it's more likely to have a greater effect on you unconsciously. So in that respect, that they are tapping into something that I think is strong, potentially and therefore is very worrisome. It isn't that the, the, the cues, the stimulants, are invisible to the naked eye. It's just that we don't recognize them for what they are. So the most notorious example of this would be the Newport cigarette ads, which simply show happy couples frolicking in the green. But you realize, uh, after you look closely, that these are really sort of sadomasochistic dramas that either the man or the woman is, is in fatal control of the situation. So that would strike me as a good example of a subliminal pitch. It's all right there on the surface. We just don't know that the surface is, in fact, exactly what it is. For me, the bottom line, as I was saying before, you don't mess with the unconscious, because you don't know. You don't know what the effects might be. 70s.
inside ad agencies that work side by side with evil people. You know, to see, did anybody anywhere do any of this? And no. I remember the first commercial I ever did was a Hawaiian Punch commercial. And I remember putting the, the message, sugar is bad for you, just you know, set it in low volume in the background. And everybody in the room's tapping their pencils and they're all, you know, they're just all these execs and, and the creative people are all going, yeah, that's Hawaiian Punch, yeah. And they're just like singing the song and they're just like, and we're looking at each other and we're like, nobody heard it yet. And it was like, sugar is bad for you. Went down on the commercial and it went out nationally. And, and we found a, a whole list of, of things that we were able to easily put in a commercial and never once got stopped. They must work because we said something. I remember doing a Levi commercial and saying something like, this is the uniform of the wad. And I don't know, people are, they're all wearing blue jeans now. So it must have worked. It must have helped Levi's out, I guess. I'm sure that if I can put, you know, uh, subliminal messages in, in a commercial, that uh, advertising agencies must have a much easier time of it and probably can do it in much bigger ways. Good afternoon, Amalgamated. This is Carmen. We were wondering if someone from Amalgamated would be interested in um, meeting with us. Good afternoon, that must be a BBL. Can you tell me who you're transferring me to? Good afternoon, David. Send me a voicemail. Advertisers just can't admit it. I mean, of course they can't admit it. They're not going to say they embed, you know, phalluses and cigarette ads. I used to work in advertising for many years as a research director. And all I ever got in response to uh, uh, my questions were obscenities. Contrary to what many people think, subliminal advertising is not really illegal. What happened in 1984 is really the culmination of a long story, you know. Orwell's book, 1984, some have said predisposed Congress to investigate Orwellian techniques. And of course, subliminal is often thought of as an Orwellian technique. There had been complaints, and Congress investigates complaints from their constituents. The House Subcommittee on Science and Technology wants to find out if the technology is being abused. Kansas Democrat Dan Glickman is chairman. I myself think that, think that subliminal communication clearly has a twilight zone implication to it. I think it's incumbent upon us in Congress to at least explore the issue to see how widespread it is. The veritable who's who of the advertising world appeared. And they argued subliminal does not work. We don't use it, and we don't use it because it doesn't work. University of Michigan's Dr. Howard Chevron called for a moratorium on the technique until further study is completed. Although this may sound like science fiction, we may be on the threshold of invading the individual's perhaps last stronghold of personal privacy, his own inner thoughts. 
My estimation is that they certainly got sufficient evidence that something along those lines was happening. The conclusion in their report was that it was unlikely to be having the effects that uh, were claimed. The law in Congress did not pass. The laws didn't pass anywhere in any state because of what I believe was a deliberate disinformation campaign designed to make the public feel comfortable. We don't use it, and if we did, it wouldn't work. In front of you is a manual. This manual was sent to me and is a training manual of one of the largest advertising agencies on the planet. And this training manual, very in a very sophisticated way, lays out several ad campaigns that have actually run. Major products, how they embedded both taboo imagery, devils and whatnot, and sexual imagery. So, not used, I know that is just flagrantly false. There was a memo, which I have a copy of at home, from the National Association of Advertising Agencies. They went out to every advertising agency in the country, advising them what to do if I come to town. They said, keep the hell away from this guy. A crazy person writes a book about a, a fraudulent joke experiment and ends up creating such a stir that an organization is created, the American Association of Advertising Agencies, to dispel the myth. Kip Chang. From what company? Uh, 4A. You can't shoot in this building. The fact that you won't meet with me. You know, what is. Blue eyes out. I will talk to you. Okay. Talking about people from cradle to grave being exposed to subliminal messages, it must be that some people, some borderline personalities are pushed over the edge and, and uh, led to commit horrible crimes because of the influence of advertising. There is loose in their towns people like me today whose dangerous impulses are being fueled day in and day out by violence in the media in its various forms, particularly sexualized violence. If advertisers and corporations could be massaging our subconscious with these tactics, in what way might our own government be programming us? In the 2000 presidential campaign, uh, George Bush ra ran an attack the ad against his plan, opponent, Al Gore. The Bush prescription plan, seniors choose. And at the end of the ad, it said, bureaucrats decide. And for a brief second, for about a 30th of a second, the, the letters R-A-T-S got very large. When this came out, it was a very big deal for at least one and a half news cycles. Well, some people in the advertising industry say they believe the inclusion of the word rats was intentional, even if it was not designed to send a subliminal or subconscious message. Now, that is not an accident. 
Will Robinson is a Democratic media consultant not associated with the Gore campaign. He finds it implausible that no one noticed the word rats when the ad was in production. Someone made a decision to put that word up on screen and make it part of the spot. And they worked hard to make sure it was that way. The Bush campaign, of course, has denied this. They say that it was an accident. Just ask the man who made the so-called rats ad, Republican consultant Alex Castellanos. Let me see if I can say this more clearly for you. I didn't know it was there. It's a ridiculous thing. There is no secret rat strategy to win an election that I'm aware of. You had both Gore and Lieberman decrying this use of subliminal advertising. I find it a, a very disappointing development. Uh, I've never seen anything quite like it. George Bush was forced to do his best to disassociate himself from this entire thing. Uh, which he actually did very effectively. You know, the idea of putting subliminal messages in the ads, I don't think we need to be subliminal about the differences between our views. Subliminal messages. You talk about subliminal. So if the guy can't pronounce it, he couldn't have been behind it, I guess. The ad has run 4,400 times in 16 states, including big battlegrounds like Florida, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Recount that's occurring in Florida is an automatic recount based on state law. It was not requested by the Gore campaign. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. This week on Science Sensei. Remember subliminal advertising? Now cognitive scientists at Hebrew University in Jerusalem have shown that some thoughts and behaviors can be affected subconsciously and subliminally by commonly used symbols. They asked Israeli volunteers to complete a computer-based survey about their opinions on core issues in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But for half of the volunteers, subliminal images of the Israeli flag were flashed throughout the question and answer session. The flashes were 16 milliseconds, faster than we can do here. You might expect that exposure to such a strong nationalistic image would polarize people to one political extreme or the other. But in this case, the subliminal image of the flag pulled people from both ends of the political spectrum toward the middle compared to the control group. And phone calls to these people after the elections confirmed that most of them followed through when they actually voted. This research is important because it shows that subliminal messages can affect your attitude and behavior. For Science Central News, I'm your Science Sensei. I'm Science Sensei and I approve this message. A video news release, or a VNR, is created by a public relations agency, usually, in order to communicate a specific message on the behalf of a client, whether it's a politician, or a corporation, or a government office. The use of video news releases um, has to be challenged at every level in this country, VNRs as they're known. The government puts them out, corporations put them out. They'll have a fake reporter who's actually a public relations professional. And this story goes out to newsrooms around the country. So there are people watching a program that they think is news, but the actual news reports aren't news reports at all, but are paid advertisements that look like news reports. This is someone pushing a product, but it's presented as a fair and balanced report, which it, of course, isn't. While I don't know if I would call that subliminal, I do think that it fits into this entire environment of so much of our media operating on a below-the-radar 
below the threshold of consciousness. There are hundreds of channels. Can they all be doing this? What matters though is not the channels, it's who owns those channels. Uh, and that issue of media consolidation is critical. The rise in the use of video news releases has a great deal to do with the conglomeration of the mass media. Because as more and more TV stations around the country come to be owned by the you know, fewer and fewer players, there's more and more cost cutting that goes on in the newsrooms of these stations. You know, when you look at a media environment where only five or six companies control the vast majority of the world's media, and they work in collaboration with each other, and they share members of boards of directors and things of that nature. Like, in the same way that I say we have to broaden our concept of subliminal, I think we also have to broaden our concept of what a conspiracy is. They're using our airwaves, and they have a responsibility to bring out the full diversity of opinion and to get to the truth, not to bring you uh, news stories that are disguised as their own when they're simply government or corporate propaganda. I, I think uh, that we're censored heavily without us even realizing it. I mean, just omitting a story from a newspaper is censorship. That happens every day. This is why media monopoly matters. You really can silence uh, different views. You can silence dissent when a few media moguls own so much, when you have just a few framing um, who is right and who is wrong, who is evil and who is good. The Bush-Cheney administration has used VNRs to, to push their pre prescription drug plan, and they, they've used it particularly heavily in, in trying to spread the word about the weapons of mass destruction inside Iraq. That is no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war. The campaign has been one of disinformation and misinformation. The war in Iraq was based on lies. That's generally accepted. Uh, it's interesting there's been no consequences. This administration has uh, sunk to the lowest level to use media and uh, to use certain forms of it to deceive a nation. Iraq's weapons of mass a destruction. Clear threat to the United States. And there's dozens of ballistic missiles. It is sponsored and sheltered terrorists. Paying suicide Chemical bombers. weapons are equally true. Biological weapons, including anthrax and botulism toxins. Biological and chemical agent to kill millions of people. I remember the Secretary of State saying we have to take the war to them before they bring it to us. It simply makes no sense to wait any longer. Take action before it's too late. Delay, indecision, and inaction could lead to a massive and sudden harm. But there should be criminal implications for this kind of behavior. I think it's both subliminal and definitely uh, very obvious. I mean, you have in the lead up to protests, the um, alert levels going up, uh, people being afraid. What does fear do to a people? It, number one, it blocks their thinking. And if you continue to drum away that we're in danger of being attacked all the time, then people do not broaden their thoughts. It's our responsibility as journalists to let the public know who is paid by what corporation or if they're representing the government. Otherwise, it's unforgivable. The media is our lens on the world, and it is absolutely critical we trust that media. Because ultimately, when people are terrorized, when people are targeted, when people are marginalized, that does not make any of us safer. Peace, not war, is our natural condition. Those who would bid us to war must be challenged.
you start to talk about psyops, of course, people start looking for your tinfoil hat. Psychological operations is what I prefer because psyop kind of sounds like it's a, you know, clandestine thing. And I'm not into conspiracy theories per se. The fact is that highly sophisticated ways of, of incapacitating people, of terrifying them, making them anxious, our military and our intelligence bureaus have been studying this kind of invisible weaponry for decades. I mean, it's at least as old as the Cold War. Emphasis then is how do you crank out leaflets and uh, things of that nature. Of course, technology has moved considerably since then. The focus today has shifted dramatically to, I think, a more generic term of uh, perception management. How do you project the image of the Army in this day and age? The U.S. government and military has poured hundreds of millions of dollars into propagandizing the Iraqi people in paying newspapers, reporters, editors uh, to plant stories in Iraqi media. Now, what does this do when you talk about uh, the U.S. military forces moving forward and there being victory and Iraqis on the ground seeing that what they're seeing in their newspapers and on television doesn't reflect the reality? It undermines any kind of growth of democracy because then they have no confidence, no trust of their media. In this country, we have a law, the smith munt Act, against propagandizing our own population. It goes back to the Nazis in World War II, and we saw the dangers of that. Um, it's all justified by saying, no, it's giving information to other countries. But Donald Rumsfeld has made it pretty clear that the success will be when it blows back. So you plant a story there, and it gets quoted back here. Uh, the war is really being waged at home, the war on truth. In today's day and age, as we know, information is global and instantaneous. Uh, so the ability to keep information out of American hands is extremely difficult. You know, the Gulf War was, was interesting, the first Gulf War in the early 90s, when, you know, when the whole uh, war was taking place, we were asked often, you know, are there new systems being used here? Because the way in which one of the largest armies in the world essentially gave up, I mean, it was like children in an elementary school on their first fire drill, running out of the bunkers and surrendering. And from my perspective, it looked like um, one of these technologies for influencing behavior had been applied, and it was the Scottish media after the war that reported on Project Solo. But now we have very sophisticated systems like Commando Solo, uh, C-130 that's basically uh, an airborne television radio station that circles the area broadcasting the message uh, directly in that you want to uh, uh, have the enemy receive. But one of the other things they do is they piggyback signals on other carriers. In other words, the broadcast already going on in the area. In other words, the Muslim music and prayers that all of these troops were listening to every day, um, they would piggyback a signal on that that would create uh, anxiety and fear as an emotional state. Not the, that I'm aware of. To disclose uh, these technologies, this changes everything. One of the finest articles on the subject is an article called The Mind Has No Firewalls. And if you look at it, it is um, a fine explanation of all of the various ways to carry a signal in that would influence human behavior uh, at a distance. Whether you use TV, radio, um, electrical grids, um, the internet, all of these things can be effectively used and have been demonstrated. These technologies that we're talking about today, because the American public wouldn't accept them, 
because the American public would see them as a violation of the Constitution, the only way they could be introduced is an environment of fear. And what environment do we have today? You know, this is an Occam issue, Occam's razor. The simplistic stuff works. But the idea first was they looked at chemical means, telepathine, uh, LSD, all of the psychoactive drugs to see what would happen. They also started to look at electromagnetic means, even as early as that, to manipulate behavior. Eventually, it came out on the President's Commission on the CIA activities in the United States that eventually showed uh, that the CIA had been involved uh, and the FBI involved and other agencies involved in mind control techniques being applied against American citizens without consent. And MK Ultra was um, a, a part of that. And in what may be the weirdest turn of events so far, the loudspeakers also pumped out Tibetan monastery chants at steadily increasing volume, named straight at Rock Van Koresh's sanctuary. They were warned that this could heighten uh, matters, and they decided to take the risk. And those loudspeakers that were on vehicles were actually also delivering other information. Now we're talking about words and specific voices that people would recognize on a subliminal level that they would not consciously be aware of. They, they tried a number of things. We know that they tried the sounds of killing rabbits and things of that nature that are supposed to be, you know, intuitively and, uh, abhorrent. Noise that would affect you on, on a fear level, to create fear and anxiety. Um, really though, you know, when you think about it, is that really the right thing you wanted to do in that environment? Or did you want to bring people to calmness, to thinking more clearly, to being more analytical? You know, what they did is they agitated the situation. They created an explosive situation. The results are now clear. The simplistic stuff works. HARP is the uh, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. It was originally a joint effort of the uh, Air Force and Navy. It's now run by DARPA. Uh, it's just dropped a little bit in terms of classification, but it has multiple uh, possibilities and, and lots of effects. They just finished um, upgrading it from 48 antenna to 180. The, the, the thing about HARP is an instrument designed to do exactly what Persinger was talking about, which is this idea of modulating uh, the ionosphere. Uh, in, in a way that can be used for weapons applications. Uh, why we're concerned about it is earth penetrating tomography. And earth penetrating tomography in plain language or by analogy would be like x-raying the earth. It's not using x-rays of course, but it's the same concept. Predominantly in, uh, has to do with communications because of our, our long range communications we use, uh, you know, bouncing the signal off and down. What are the effects of bouncing a wave like that off of the ionosphere, do you think? Uh, probably very minimal. It probably goes up and mostly goes down. It's like punching the ionosphere. And every punch of high frequency causes the ionosphere to vibrate in harmony. That creates, it converts the ionosphere from direct current to alternating current, and then it behaves as a giant broadcast antenna, pumping the signal back to the Earth in the ELF range. case of um, ELF, uh, where you have these very low pulsed signals, you get what's called a frequency following response, an FFR in the literature, or brain entrainment is often referred to it in that way. And this is where the brain actually locks onto these external signals, even these very, very subtle signals. It locks on and begins to mirror, and so the brain patterns fall into those patterns, which is a change in emotional state. In the conspiracy arena, they, they talk about a whole host of effects 
uh, up to and including turning people into zombies or whole societies into zombies and, and all that. Again, the evidence against that is I haven't got any societies of zombies. Our Bob Tobe is doing a pretty good job on that, by the way. Look at them. You know, when you talk about conspiratorialists, let's talk about the military and what their job is. Their job is to think of every horrible situation that could ever occur and then develop a plan around it. That's conspiracy theorist at the ultimate level with billions and trillions of dollars to spend to figure it out. Propagandists will go to any lengths to influence people's opinion, including murders, right? I mean, whoever's responsible for 9-11, were they doing it to kill those 3,000 people? Or were they doing it to influence the world? I want people to follow orders, push buttons, stand in line. They're afraid to death of the rogue mentality. When you manipulate people, it's anti-democratic. What you're really trying to do is you're trying to control people. People don't need to be controlled. They need to be able to make their own decisions. Consciousness to freedom to think is a fundamental human right. The idea of violating free will is something that even God doesn't do. And yet man thinks they can do this. At this defining moment, change has come to America. Baghdad 3,966. Lives have glamour. I am the queen of opulence. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets. Turn them off now. Turn them off right now. Turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of the center. will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. You've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. If we can get a critical mass of people thinking a direction, it will influence and change the rest of the world. This collective mind, this mind feel, tend to lead me to believe that that might be the greatest hope man has.